December 26, 1945. That's three quarters of a century. Anyhow, I only stayed in Florida for two years because my father died and her mother then moved her four children back to our apartment in Woodside, Queens. And my mother taught me to sew, which eventually that became my money earning career. For a long time, photography was just a hobby. The first little snapshot is of my son when I had to get married at age 18. I made his costume as Santa Claus, and he was my little doll. And every holiday, he became an Easter buddy and anything that fit the occasion. This was a costume that I made when the Rolling Stones were coming to New York for their opening. They chose the 10 top designers in New York, and I happened to be one of them. Here you'll see a peacock costume that I made out of velvet and hand painted all the peacock eyes all around it and made each a separate section. This is Joanne Landis wearing a costume I made for her, her dress and her cape, her coat. She was a fashion illustrator and I went to high school with her as my best friend. That down the block, I had a store called Flow Like Water where I made costumes from antique fabrics from the 40s and the 50s. Next, there is a picture of inner tube inside a gas station. And we had a flat tire, my friend, and I pushed the car. And I thought this looked kind of sexy. The workman there looked at me like I was a weirdo. But this became my business car. Next. And this picture I thought sort of matched. <laughs> it was taken right in front of the Vatican. They had six of these phallic symbols. And I call it Steve Peters. Next. This photo was back in my old neighborhood in Woodside, Queens where I grew up and used to balance on that same fence, tight rope walking, just like these little girls were. Next. Boy, this is uh, quite a story, isn't it? Absolutely. She was born blind in one eye, colorblind in the other. At the age of 30, she was stricken with multiple sclerosis and now is legally blind and, and cannot walk. And yet, despite these physical challenges, she's an award-winning photographer. Really quite a story and quite a lady, too. And here she is, Miss Flo Fox. Hi, Flo. Hello. How are you? Nice to see you, and welcome to the show. Hello, Thank Flo. You. Good to have Hello. you with us. So that's a handy little cart. Huh? <laughs> yes, it is. That's terrific. Anyway, I just told everybody the story here. You were born blind in one eye. Yeah. And then gradually lost sight in the other one, huh? Uh, I lost the sight immediately, actually, when I was 30 years old due to multiple yeah. sclerosis. I got you. Yeah. You know, people don't realize that MS strikes uh, mostly women. Uh, three yeah. out of five victims of MS are women in the prime of their life. Is that right? Yes. Hmm. Usually at age 30, mm -hmm. anywhere between 20 and 40. Right. When did you take up photography? Um, when I was about 26 years old, and uh, I was a stylist and a tailor for television commercials. Uh -huh. And uh, photography was only a hobby back then, although I had pictures published and in exhibits, but it was not a way to earn a living. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, can you see me now? Am I blurry or am I... You... I see through a net. Um, like a stocking over your face, yes, right? Yes, like mm -hmm. two stockings that are moving so that everything glitters. 
the world is flawless. Nobody has pimples or acne. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Isn't that a great idea? Not a pimple on me, Flo. <laughs> now, Flo, uh, but then how are you able to take pictures? Yes. I use an automatic focusing camera uh -huh. and an autofocus enlarger for printing and talking timers. And technology has kept up with my needs. That's incredible. And you, isn't and you it? even teach others who are blind uh, yes. right here in New York at the Lighthouse. Yes. Right? I taught at the Lighthouse for the Blind, the Village Nursing Home, and seminars all over at museums. It's Fabulous. terrific. Well, let's take a look at some of the photographs now, and we can talk a little bit about them. The first one we're going to show you was called The Youngs, England. This goes back to 1973, right? Yes. Uh, I took that when my son and I were hitchhiking through Europe when he was a little boy. Mm -hmm. And we went to eight different countries, and this was the beginning of our trip. Uh -huh. It was the first photograph I ever had published in Fabulous. 1974. Oh, that's a thrill. The woman's isn't it? reflection, really. Yeah, I know. The lighting is just fantastic. Thank you. On my hitchhiking tour, instead of going to museums, I would always go to cemeteries to see the history of the town. This stone is a monument of Louise Michel who hit out all these politicians and fighters, and they were all killed there. It was a commune, a Paris commune. You can look at the top at all their bullet holes where they were shot and killed, and at the bottom where they were buried. Next. This one is called Hangman. It looked sort of like a modern art sculpture in Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. I always go back to Paris and hang out because that cemetery is Chopin and Oscar Wilde and Sarah Bernard and Jim Morrison, many famous people, and Edith Piaf. Next. This what I call Night of the Living Dead. And it's very dark and gruesome only because it was after the rain, which some of it was still on the stone. I have to give my photos titles only because if they sell in Europe and say, Miss Fox, we just sold untitled, I wouldn't know what to send. This is where Eric Weiss was buried. He called himself Houdini. The bust is of him, and at the bottom is the wife kneeling. But she wasn't buried there because she wasn't Jewish. I would have thought he would have preferred to make magic even after his death. The Police would not give the cemetery the stone back when it was stolen and it was missing for years until I showed them I had the photo. And they said, can we use that to get back the stone? I said, can you give me a plot near Houdini with my son? And that's how I got my future. <laughs> Next. This is people, petrified people, in Mexico, in a town called Guanajuato, where if you don't pay for your plot in time, they dig up the bodies and put it in the south center of town to show and embarrass the people that they didn't pay in time. And because the mineral content is so great, the people in their clothing never totally rot. Next. This photo is called Trying Their Wings. I was actually sitting on a bench, seeing in a very far distance the Statue of Liberty, and then photographing all these pigeons at my feet that looked like there were a bunch of gossips chattering away. When I heard these footsteps, and I knew it was going to disturb my photo, and I held my breath and grabbed this shot. To me, it's one in a million. Next. 
then I had a TV show called A Photo Flow Show. And I'm sitting with Leif Erickson, not the guy who discovered America, but the guy who worked for Camera 35 magazine. He wrote an article called We Tried It. And it was about the first autofocus camera in America. And I feel tested it for it because I just became visually impaired due to multiple sclerosis. Next. Here, it looks like a, a sand a timer, but instead, you don't look at the black part of the photo, you look at the whites each side. On the left is me, on the right is Gigi Stoll. I was teaching her how to print. We just laid our heads under the enlarger. Next. Oh, this is when I started my protest. Well, actually, I did it for a long time, but I was stopping buses if they forgot their key, if the driver wouldn't open up the ramp, which he could do at that time. They would call the police because I would stop the bus. I had these five officers that I said, go ahead, arrest me, take care of me, feed me. And instead, they spoke and ordered a bus and I got my ride downtown just by myself. It was like a big limbo. <laughs> Next. I would then write to the city and tell them there is no ramp on this corner and I have to get to an appointment. I'll give you two weeks to build it. If not, I will. And they would say, look, it costs $1,600. We don't have the money. So I would go out and spend about $20, get my cement, sit on the ground. I was able-bodied enough. And a man stopped and said, lady, are you okay? Do you need help? And I said, yeah, can you help mix the cement? And then I would pour it and just trowel it build my own ramps all over the city. And the newspaper said, crazy photographer goes out at midnight to build ramps. Next. This is someone to talk to, 1974. I was walking to visit a friend, heard someone talking on a bunch, quickly turned, took the photo, but the photo, the old man was looking at me. And then he felt secure because I guess I didn't look dangerous. And then I got this shot when he went back to talking to his dog. Dog seems bored. Next. There was a magazine called Camera 35 that had the story about the first autofocus camera. This photo was included. It's a little girl sucking her thumb, her father driving the car, and it's called Everybody Sucks. Next. This is a great <laughs> endangered species. Can't see it. Endangered species. Oh, this was a crowd of ladies all sitting on a bench at a park. And I just thought it was amazing how they were all lined up. Grabbed the shot. When I went home and printed it and discovered there was a man asleep in the middle. <laughs> That's how it got the title, Endangered Species. This is terrific. Next. 
This was a series I did for Playboy Press. And it's unique because it was black and white infrared film, which doesn't work on how much light the camera takes in, but how much heat. It was discovered for the war if plants were all put in a place that they might not should have been, then there might have been a bomb underneath it. And this film made it glow. This was the first in the series of 11 photos. Next. And this is how the series progressed. One woman, two men. At first, it seemed like it was just in her dream. Yeah. You're not really sure. But at the end, you see her lying alone in bed. I made the soft edges around the enlarger by putting interfacing from my tailoring days what you'd put inside a man's collar. And then the black and white infrared we hand toned went to the dark room for at least a month every day. You sepia toners for the bodies, green toners for the sheets. And it happened to be a self portrait. Next. This is off the top of the World Trade Center when I snuck in the building and the guard gave me a card as if I was a real photographer. And then I went upstairs and even got a hard hat, told the foreman into bringing me to the roof. And when I heard the no noise of the men building the building, I had the foreman hold my legs, <laughs> leaned over the edge, took three shots until I said, oh, oh my God, look at how far away that goes. But I got the shot. Next. That's a crane on the roof where the cloud level is the same level. Wow. Next. Fox, uh, whose pictures uh, have been uh, getting very, very popular here in New York and all across the country. Uh, she is a photographer who I assume you've been taking pictures since you were little? It's been only for the last eight years. What got you interested in photography? I was interested ever since I was a child. Um, my parents died when I was young, and to me, the only way to hold on to anything through any type of memory was photographs. Uh, one of her friends rolling a joint while an old lady looks on in shock. Flo, you're a very progressive person, I must say. Well, she wasn't an old lady. She's a wonderful elderly lady who, uh, I actually have a series of where the woman is looking at her and then looking shocked, and then the two of them are chatting mm -hmm. afterwards. Did the elderly woman uh, decide to join your friend in this little uh, she unlawful didn't, activity? She uh, didn't smoke. Is it still unlawful? Well, I, I don't know. Okay. Some parts of the country it is, so. Okay. But she didn't join your friend in that after. No, but she sat around and accepted it. This is an invitation to a show that I had in Paris with my idol, Ouija. He stamped all the photos on back with Ouija the famous. His real name was Arthur Felling, and he shot for all newspapers, including daily news because he lived in his car sometimes he would get to the scene of the crime before the police did just by having the radios that could hear where crime was happening next this was the beginning of a series for the first shot, I didn't know it was going to become a series. It said cigarettes, 59 cents. And I said, oh, shit, I missed it. I started smoking when it was 20 
two cents a pack. <laughs> How much higher could it go? The next picture is the end of the series, mm. which says it's a dollar, uh, it's twelve fifty a pack. Wow. And then they stopped allowing you to put big signs in windows. So this was the end of the series. But next photo will show a big poster that was made of all the signs. It was in Life magazine. And it's been shown a lot. 30 years worth of cigarette signs. And up in smoke, the letters was made out of a pack of cigarettes, <laughs> which we broke up to write the letters. <laughs> Next. This is the kid in Times Square. When Times Square was really Times Square, when it was funky, when they had penny arcades, when they had prostitutes and drugs everywhere. Next. This is also Times Square. The deuce was wild. When the deuce was wild. Hmm. Next. Can't see. Oh, this what I call porn row because it's all movie theaters with dirty movies <laughs> everywhere every block next also times square with the smoke coming out of the poster next then I got to fall in love with graffiti. Anyone who left their mark, who left their art, who had something to say, I would capture it. Because of graffiti, I got addicted to using color film for the first time. Before that, I only made slides on rare occasions, which was called Kodachrome. Then this is now code of color, color film, not slides. Next. This little girl blowing bubbles with the bent buildings. I did see a man on a corner once selling big paintings of bent buildings, and I have a feeling this was his. Next. I took this photo up in Spanish Harlem where this was fighters and a great painting. And there they called it a graffiti museum outside of a high school. Some of the greatest work. Next. Just a couple reflection looking on a wall. And that's graffiti, but there was a shadow of a tree, which to me, it got more depth other than a big bare wall. Next.
like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. This is actually what my bedroom looks like. On the wall, it's a photograph I took of the Flatiron Building from a helicopter. I had gone into a camera store and the owner said, Flo, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? I said, rent a helicopter and shoot the flat iron. He said, I will sponsor you. And then years later, I built it up out of film cans to make it more dimensional. And on the bed, it's a reflection of the flat iron building which I had at my local CVS pharmacy at the make a bed spread. That photo was put down in the middle of the night, six foot photo with a big can of epoxy. And we put it down in the street, right in front of the real flat iron building. You got to see the reflection. Police went by, but I pretended I was crossing a street and they were so worried about the lady in the wheelchair, they forgot to look at what we were putting down in the street. Next. Mm. This is a reflection of the Metropolitan Life Building not far from where I live. I am addicted to reflections, whether in puddles or in the streets or in cars, anywhere. Next. Mm. This I call the 59th Street Bridge in a puddle. There are colorful gas stains and pink and green oil slicks on the top right. I'm colorblind on those colors, so, but I love the picture anyway. Actually, it's upside down. Of course, you always see a reflection upside down, but I turned the photo over. Next. Then I did a series of photos called If You Could See Like I See for the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This one I call DC Trees. The top one is the way you would see it. The bottom is the way I see with like a snowy texture in the way. But I still see enough to take a photo with a point-and-shoot autofocus camera. Next. This is a photo I took that I call Mona Luigi. People say, did you paint that? Did you paint over the painting? And I say, no. I actually took this at the Halloween parade. A man was carrying a big painting with a hole where he stuck his face through it and marched quickly and I got that shot, which I love. I have been to every Halloween parade since it began. I think it's about 38 years ago. The only one I missed was 9-11 when I was frightened that they would attack where a lot of people were. Next, devil or angel. Some people came in couples, some in groups. Every year is a different, exciting theme for the year. Next, this one we call trainees, subway trainees. They were carrying a train that they had drawn and made themselves. And this is before I even got to the parade on the way. I ran into this. Years later, 10 years later, the picture was shown in 
a newspaper. And so the guy emailed me and said, those are my legs. I recognized my legs from years ago. I thought that was funny. Next. This one is called Gay Rights. I took it down in front of the big sign on Sheridan Square, right near Stonewall, the bar where everything started changing for the gay community. This is my friend Richard, who was very gay. Next. <laughs> this what I call Riker's Coffee Shop. It was right in front of the coffee shop on Sheridan Square. A few steps from the gay rights sign, right below it. And in the middle of night, two in the morning, I saw this man without pants or at least cut out chaps. And I hid behind the coats. And I was ready to take the photo and he said, what are you doing? Handsome guy when he turned around. I said, oh, I was going to take your picture. He said, you can touch it if you want. I said, I'd rather take the picture. Thank you. And that's when I got this shot. He went back to his coffee. Next. This is a whole big building of gay people watching the gay parade go by. Every year, as much as possible, I go to the gay parade. And you see all the new rules and people fighting to cure AIDS and for the rights to get married. Everything is significant of what's going on politically. Next. I took many photos of my friends who were famous photographers. This is Lizette Modell. She and I went out to dinner every other week. Or she lived just half a block away. And I bought her book, and she wrote with great love and admiration. I still cherish that book. Next. This man is Andre Kurtaj, known for many of his photos. This was just a few weeks before he died. You could see my reflection in the mirror behind him, taking the photo with arms bent. It reminded me of his photo called Sinteric Dancer. Next. This is Gordon Parks, the black man who was the greatest photographer, filmmaker, producer. If you look him up on the internet, you'll learn a lot about him. Next, this was my TV show called The Photo Flow Show. Hello and welcome to The Photo Flow Show. My name is Flo Fox and tonight we have a very special guest, Ruth Orkin. The way I was first introduced to Ruth was her book, A World Through My Window. This book came out in 1978. And more recently, her book came out called A Photo Journal. Welcome, Ruth. Oh, it's very nice to be here. Incidentally, I'm very happy that A Photo Journal finally came out because I'm sure that the people who, have, uh, who are under 35 who saw A World Through My Window think of me as this housewife hanging out of the window with the kids screaming for attention, and they don't know that I was a photojournalist in the 40s and 50s. And this book has 170 mostly black and white photographs in it from yes. years ago. 
Yes, I know. It expands all the way from when you were 10 years old and the cameras you shot with, which we will get into later. But I am curious about the cover picture. Was this set up? Yes, uh, she was with me, and we were just doing a story for the fun of it on, uh, oh, oh, God, how could I forget it? Uh, don't be afraid to travel alone. We, w there were so many uh, glamorous posters around about how great it was to travel, and we were doing all this tongue-in-cheek. The first dozen pictures are going to be images that you may find familiar. After that, everything will be in chronological order. Woody Allen at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, when he was a stand-up comic at the Bitter End in 1963, this was an assignment for Horizon magazine. Einstein at a luncheon at Princeton University where I photographed him shaking hands with nearly 100 men who had donated $25,000 apiece to Yeshiva University. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Photo Flow Show. I'm glad you can make it tonight. Tonight we have a very special guest. It's Mr. Ralph Gibson. Welcome, Ralph. It's good to be back, Flo. Um, I met Ralph about six years ago when I lived in a loft in Soho, West Broadway, beautiful downtown. Do you still live there? Yes, yes, Flo. I think I've uh, I found a home, and until I decide where I want to live, that's where I'll live. Um, when I met you, I know, I, th I think I did something wrong, I'm not really sure, but I told my ex-husband, who was an art director of a photography magazine, Ralph Gibson is doing color. And there it was, the rumor was spread, Flo Fox announces Ralph Gibson is doing color. Was that a bad thing to do? Well, it, it did stir up a bit of concern at the time, but as it turns out, we uh, resolved it by publishing some of that in the ex-husband magazine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... It was actually a pretty dynamic move. Let those uh, those blacks, you know, get real solid and cut forms. When I took this picture, I was going to, I was thinking about the shape of her nose, and then I saw this shadow come in, and so I sort of changed my approach to the picture. I'm sitting here with Arlene Gottfried, who is a non-commercial photographer. How did you get invited to this party? I was at the ASMP meeting for the New York chapter, and I got an invitation. I showed work there, and um, then I got an invitation to this party. Are you having any shows or books now? I'm contemplating publishing a book, and there's a show in Germany of the uh, history of portrait photography around the world. And I feel very honored to be in that show, and a catalog should be coming out shortly. Let's take a look at the monitor and see some of your work. Smithsonian thanking me for my work in a show called Hip Hop Don't Stop. Next. That's me and Joan Rivers. She used to deliver meals to me. Oh, do we have the film of her? Can't stop at an electronic store. His PSP is broken. Uh, if you're very good, I'll buy a new one for your birthday. Well, my friend had three of them, and he gave me one. That's very nice. So, Is this the one he gave you? Yes. Uh, he had three of them? Has he got a single grandfather? <laughs> Up your hands. They have great hands, Cooper. And God's love we 
to live it when I started out, and I'm on the board. We used to give AIDS patients that were, they were going, we would give them food. Well, now AIDS is chronic, and I'm still delivering the fucking food. I am so pissed. I am so, oh, you know what it's like? Thanksgiving morning, ding dong, the guy always draw you again. <laughs> Miss Rivers, just leave it over there. I'm on my way to the gym. The gym? <laughs> You're gonna die today. AIDS or me? I'm not sure. Oh, look at that. Oh, how nice it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Entertain me for years, Miss Rivers. I'm so glad I'm a photographer. Yeah, you can see there's something going on here that's wonderful. Right there, I photographed the same drugstore for 20 years. Every time they change the price of cigarettes. Uh, oh, how brilliant is that? Thank Where was you. it shown? Life magazine. I have taken over 100,000 photos, so you might even know my work. Look up flowbox.com. Thank happy you. Thank you. I can't wait to get out of here and go home and look you up. Flow Fox, baby. <laughs> My name is Flow Fox. Flow Fox right now. What happened that caused your eyesight to start to fail? I Didn't, believe you know? it's connected with multiple sclerosis. I walk with a cane. I'm a little off balance. First, my eyes went and... Uh, oh, so minutes. sad. There's a sexy, young, artistic, edgy, New York, tough... Bohemian girl. That's amazing, isn't it? Life is so mean. That's me and Lou Reed. If you remember, he made a song, Take a Walk on the Wild Side. Next. This is a photo my attendant took. And I said, hurry up, grab the camera, go forward, catch just the shadows of that family. And since it had been raining out, it made it all spotted and textured. Next. And put I noticed to all my attendants to please show me what was going on during this COVID-19 period because I was not going out. And each of them took photos. This was by Celeste Brown. She took many. Maybe she'll be a photographer when she grows up. Anyhow. There are more photos. Next. I wrote uh, in my Facebook, thank you to the attendants. Next. For showing me what I'm missing out there. Next. Here at the end is a picture of me with Kate Jackson pretending she's me. And I'm having the picture taken, imitating her pretending she's me because she wanted to play me in a movie. Many people have bought my rights, the option to my life story. Transatlantic Enterprises. And Oh, many people, but anyhow, I'm free. So now go out, be careful, wash your hands and all that. Good night. Flo, do you have, uh, could you answer a couple of questions for us? Sure. Uh, uh, w this is probably you've been asked about how your physical challenges affect your photography and perhaps in a negative way, but can you, can you say that your physical challenges have 
in some way helped your photography? An interesting fact is once I said to a doctor, how come as I fall apart, I don't get depressed? Yes. He said some people with MS get suicidal, get very depressed. Other people get euphoric. Uh -huh. I said, wow. <laughs> so I'm the euphoric kind, aren't I lucky? <laughs> He said, don't be so happy about it. You might never come back down to earth. Oh. I said, oh, that's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and I still take my humorous pictures yes. or things, things that I call ironic reality. I, I was, uh, I, I really thought that the blend of very evocative work and also very funny work is it's unusual most people most photographers will tend to be one or the other but you have the the image of uh, that pole the saint peter's pole that follows the image of what could be considered another sexual organ the the combination is very funny and okay. the, uh, yes, and that the photograph of the um, the guy with without pants or with chaps. I thought that was <laughs> it was a very funny photograph. Uh, but it was you, just luck, <laughs> as I think many good photographs are. But then you have I, the the photograph of the it was called um, endangered species, where there are there's a row of nice little old ladies all chatting, and then there's one man asleep. Uh, it was so, um, it really was evocative, but really it just felt like this, it said so much about age and um, men. lottery. I, I, I had another question about, you, at, you did say that you, um, are, can't see colors. Is that right? Uh, not intensely, but I get a hint. Because at some point you started to use color film, and I wondered how how that looked to you. I mean, it must be hard to describe that, but that process. But how did that look to work with if color? The, if the color's intense, I get a hint of what it is. If uh -huh. it's pale, pink might be beige. Green might be gray. Uh -huh. And once when I worked as a sales girl, St. Mark store Midwest, the other sales girl said, what do you mean put the green side up? Aren't all dollars green? Oh. And that's the first time I ever met a blind person, a colorblind person. She didn't know the two sides had different colors. Mm -hmm. On the dollar bill, if you look on the back, you'll see a big number, yeah. big dark five or 10 or 20. We took, my girlfriend and I took 15 years to get the government to stamp that, print that, so visually impaired people can read their bills. They won't make braille, though. I tried. Uh, uh, we're we're lucky we get anything out of the government at the moment. But <laughs> that's just an editorial comment. Uh, so I, agree. I had two two other questions. Uh, are you still working with cloth? Do you do still do tailoring of any kind? Mentally, uh, my my hands don't work. So no, but I can teach people how to sew something, specialized things from the days when I made a 10 foot heart shaped bed for a Marilyn Monroe lookalike <laughs> and did Hammurabi's costumes oh my 2000 God. BC. And someday if you have time, I'll show you a bunch of costumes that'll blow your mind. Sure. We have to see sure. that. Then also share, asked ah. me to sew for her. But at the time I was doing Revlon and Chip and Shaw, Union Carbide Smith, 
I was doing advertising, making a thousand a day. And this young upstart, I had never heard of her. Sure. And I stupidly gave up the idea not to make her a costume. Ah. Wow. Yeah. We all have our bad choices. Yeah. Um, and our last question I, I was, um, are you able to get out and shoot now? Or can you photograph uh, outside? Right now, I don't go out. I've been shooting every day from 1972 to COVID-19. And that's the end of going out in sunshine. I go as far as my living room to the bedroom until mm. they ever find a cure. I happen to be elderly, so I got to watch my step. We understand that. <laughs> or watch my wheels. <laughs> now, I, I think you, um, we had a little uh, rehearsal yesterday, and you mentioned something about suffragettes. Would you like to uh, tell our audience what that was? Yes, because today is August 26, exactly 100 years after August 26, 1920, when women finally got the right to vote. Yes. That was the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And because of COVID-19, I could remember the number. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say we should all be voting again. Yes, definitely. We got to clean up that White House. I they exactly. took away the voting from my building now. They took away the mailboxes. These are all handicapped people or blind people who live here. And many of my friends in other disabled communities, they took away the voting and made you go, you have to go at least four or five or more blocks away. <sighs> Not a good thing. Um, Flo Fox, it's been so nice to have you here. Uh, it was a terrific performance and the wonderful work and great stories. Thank you. Can we all give you a round of applause? Really terrific. Thank you.